and welcome to Frivolous Gravitas. I am Chris Driver, and with me is Jordan Roy and the uh, Megan. I can't remember. Are we allowed to say your last name or not? No, you're not allowed. I need to be oh, super okay, secret. Good. The Megan. The Megan. We're here with. We're here also with the Megan. <laughs> <laughs> that is me. <laughs> so today we have with us are two eminent and highly esteemed academics, Jordan and Megan. Um, Joined by myself to discuss the prescription drugs, uh, or just drugs generally, I suppose, and what's unaffectionately referred to as big pharma, like the industry. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk a bit about the economic systems implemented and facilitate availability and distribution of medications, uh, ethical, safety concerns, marketing, yada, yada, yada. So we got a lot to cover, so I will stop pontificating, and I'll leave it off with Megan to tell us some a little bit about uh, drug development, just uh, so we know where we're coming from. Yeah, so it is a very long, very costly and complicated and process, very, very tedious. So um, generally to develop a drug, to bring it to market is at least 10 years, you, you often more, and costs at minimum a billion dollars and the billion dollars goes into the research itself and into the studies that need to occur um, and there's specific rules for the studies that need to occur in order to get your drug approved um, and having your drug approved by different agencies that is different countries um, will have different costs associated with it if you want to sell your drug in the states you have to get it approved by the fda and that is way more expensive than getting it approved by any other agency. However, you get the most, you will make the most money in the States because they have by far the biggest market. Um, but yeah, so that's our overview. So when you are looking for a new drug, you might start by saying, hey, here's a receptor in like, I don't know, the liver. And if we block this receptor, then it looks like we'll be able to slow liver cirrhosis, the development of liver cirrhosis. Okay, sweet. We don't really have a drug that does that. So let's try to research that. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to look for th compounds, molecules that block this receptor. So you'll start with just looking for things that block this receptor. You, you might also be looking at drugs that already exist, because if you remarket a drug for a different indication for a different purpose um so say you had a drug that was being used only for people with like high blood pressure but now you find that oh wow it actually really helps with like kidney disease so let's just switch like it's a lot cheaper to do that than redevelop a whole new drug and go through the whole process of can we give this to humans safely right so so it's like yes. theoretical chemistry basically you sort of trying yeah, to, trying to like, cross brand uh, properties from one chemical interaction to another and sort of repurpose it to an outcome that has no mm -hmm. side effects, hopefully. That, well, that has some benefit because like if you have a drug that already is on the market and then you can say, oh, you can also use it for this, then you can make a lot of money doing that. And then you don't have to do all the process work to get it to market because it's already on the market. So that's that's a shortcut. Um, but when you're doing screening, you might also like traditionally this was done a lot by looking at natural compounds. So like you might have like a specific plant that people were using to fight malaria or something. So you'll be like, hey, there's probably something in this plant that helps us fight malaria. And yeah. that's where all of our malaria drugs come this from. This is worth getting into a bit because there's mm -hmm. a couple like we you mentioned um, theoretical chemistry, which I thought was a great little uh, phrase. But and thank you. I and, thought it was apropos. <laughs> but a lot of the critiques of, um, I guess, um, pharmaceuticals is that well, you can just find it in nature. It's why don't why don't you know if we just go to the rainforest, everything we need is there. And um, as a historian, when you're studying history of medicine, um, which I had to do, you know, a couple times, uh, but what you find out is that that's exactly what scientists were doing for the last. 200 years because it's easy if you can find this compound you if you find some people who are like yeah we do this it relieves our pain and the scientist goes why with dollar signs in their eyeballs um, so yeah, well like the, <laughs> we're well, trying the reason to that find we, that we are act, yeah like, well at this point it's just more efficient when you have like computer animation or like 
you, you can like use computers to predict what kind of molecules are going to fit into a receptor or whatever you're trying to do. Or you have like 10,000 compounds that you have easy access to that you can test to see if they do what you want them to do. It's just easier to do that. That is to say, there is still people that are researching plants and saying like, why aren't we like, this seems to help with this thing. Like, why aren't we using that? And a lot of times what happens is, um, for instance, like even the malaria drugs, they or like penicillin, which is produced by, by fungus, by fungi. Um, but we have made so many drugs based on penicillin by like adding groups here and there. And like, you like add side chains and change the structure a little bit. So it still binds to the receptor it's supposed to bind to, but now it's like more resistant to uh, resistance mechanisms or it, you don't have to take it as often because penicillin you have to take fairly often. It doesn't stay in your body very long. Yeah. The so, original penicillin was kind of a horrific treatment. And there, there were, they used to use IM injections, which were extremely painful. Um, the only place I've seen that used for nowadays is, is um, syphilis actually, but um, there I'm sure it's used in other things. Um, but nowadays you can usually use other more similar drugs. Like amoxicillin is probably one of the more common mm -hmm. um, drugs that's used that is basically penicillin with an extra group added onto it to make it a little more stable. So um, I think I, that's, that conversation sort of comes to two sides. Um, like on the one hand, there's people that say, I want to take it right from the plant. And on the other hand, the chemists are saying, well, it did come from the plant. We're just synthesizing it so you don't get all the extra stuff you don't want. Mm -hmm. So like both sides are saying they want the pure form to the to the medication, but they're just coming at it from a different approach. Some people yeah. like ones that found it in nature, clean and pure, and the others like mm -hmm. we just isolated the isotopes that you need. So essentially <laughs> one side's paying for the aesthetic <laughs> and well, the marketing. The, even something like 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 weed. Um Weed is really hard to talk about because there's a lot of there is some research on it, but it's all like not super concrete and we don't really know a whole lot. But like if you're taking weed, it's got hundreds of compounds in it that all do stuff. And even if you try to isolate some of the main ones and give them therapeutically, they don't seem to have the same effect as when you take the whole plant together. So there's a lot of research going into that. Why is it like that? Maybe we can just take two or three compounds and get the same effect. Like, and then we can sell that in a different form or do something else. Like, Which, we don't know that. So that's, there's research going into it now that cannabis is being legalized in more countries and more states. Um, that research is going to, there's a lot of money in that research now, at least more than there was 10 years ago. So Marijuana's we'll see where that goes. One, though, because with marijuana, it's not like they made it illegal for any reason. They realized a hundred years later that the reason they they made it illegal was stupid, and now suddenly we have yes. to like backtrack and check and verify everything. And like, yeah, it was never well, harmful to begin with. It was just a stupid political racist war. Yeah, yeah, like, like it can be harmful if you overuse it, but like, yeah, but so can so water. can yeah. Well, <laughs> and like, well, that like on other pe people like this like this argument gets used a lot, but like alcohol. If someone discovered alcohol today and then said this should be legal for everyone to use, that would not happen. People would be buying it on the street, prohibition era style. Like there's alcohol is extremely damaging, not just to your liver, but it increases your t your incidence of cancer like in several different types of cancers. It like contributes to like heart problems, just like basically everything is there's so many things related to alcohol use. But but, maybe but Alcohol is humanity's friend. You wouldn't abandon a friend, wouldn't you? That's the that's natural. the point I'm making. Is it's that fermented? We, yeah, we haven't banned it yet, so we can't now. But we um, tried banning it in the 20s, and it was a disaster. Well, the Americans didn't. It was just like, oh wow, that made things worse. Well, and this brings us to the point of harm reduction, which is the most effective way to deal with this. Even though it sounds like harm reduction, I'll explain what it is. But you're basically um, instead of like making people stop doing behaviors that you don't want them to do, you just allow them an avenue to do it more safely. So that's things like safe injection supplies for people using injection drugs and, um, like things like methadone, opioid an agonist therapy, like methadone and suboxone, which you might like take a daily dose of, like, those are the types of things that, and uh, they actually like make a huge difference in terms of like cost to the system and incidents of other diseases, something like hepatitis C and HIV, which 
um, you can get from using is there data that supplies, it so. aids better in um, not recovery but like renunciation of it it helps people well because people you can be on methadone or suboxone and then work a job and you can like better basically do everything heroin or yeah because you well you control the dose so you and you know what's in it like that's a pro sometimes when you're buying something um, where you don't know where it's coming from it can be laced with other substances and substances interact with each other and it can cause a lot of issues so giving people clean supplies of drugs to use is much better than just saying don't use the drugs because oh, people so are still going to use it but they're like, just going to use it less safely it's like high schools handing out condoms instead of teaching abstinence which exactly that's exactly what it is the kids it's, are going to get up anyway so you might as well make them do it safely there's studies showing that if you just give high school students IUDs then the incidence of pregnancies like goes down an insane amount and then there's like a you you recover those costs not just with like pregnancies but then like teen like pregnancies in high school can lead to a lot of other issues that can cause the system in other ways so All the like you you absolutely well like kids who want it obviously you're not going to like insert it in someone that doesn't want it right like like the the, the boys yes the boys <laughs> the boys get it put no <laughs> the Sorry. Yeah. Carry on. Jordan's there, being there ridiculous. There are also, like, but... countries, entire countries who have made public social policies already. Like, we don't even need studies for drugs. We can see Portugal and, you know, Holland and Czech mm -hmm. Republic. Or... Yeah. Like, it, there's a bunch of them all over the world. I've even seen um, data on having, like, pe places where you can purchase alcohol that's also harm reduction. And it. Mm. And if you have these places and then you can, you have like other supports there, social workers, like nurses, people that can help with the actual symptoms, then people will be less likely to drink more harmful alcohols like ethylene glycol or methanol or things like that. And they'll and, be passing and, like, by a pamphlet and a helpline and like yeah, so they and have resources every time they pick it up. They have an option to change their life. Yeah. It's basically just a cheap bar with social workers and nurses but like it really the these sort of like harm reduction principles are definitely like the evidence all points towards that as the most effective way of helping people that are addicted of just helping substances. people yeah so because yeah what um so these are now i do want to get back to um yeah <laughs> where we have a we have a problem which is some sort of disease uh or um just just some medical issue and they think okay we we um where does like it's not just some inventor and then that inventor invents some drug and then or finds some you know tribe who's found some plant that'll like cure it mm -hmm. and then then you know the pharmaceutical company comes in and buys out his company yeah I'm Let thinking me, that yeah. happens very rarely. You don't have like rogue inventors like you would in engineering. Not anymore, especially. Like everything is so you you have like these huge teams, and they're going to be the ones that are going to find things. So, mm -hmm. um, I'll get back to where I was in my story. We kind of got sidetracked, which is all right. Um, so you'll start your screening looking at like thousands of compounds, like we talked about. Um, and you'll start to narrow it down by doing more tests. You'll be looking at like the actual chemistry of these drugs. Like, can they, and you'll look at things like, can they survive acid? Because if you're taking a drug as a tablet, it needs to either survive acid or you have to put it in a formulation that protects it from your stomach acid, things like that. You'll also look at like, you'll grow them in cells, see how it affects the cells. If you grow it in cells and the cells start, like, doing weird wonky things, you might want to figure that out because it might not, it's probably not going to work. Because the drugs is a very fine, it's a very fine balance between working and being toxic, like efficacy and toxicity. It's like, they can be very close together. So you need to be able to find a compound that your body can process and get rid of, but also not too quickly so it can do its job so there's a lot of like very complex interactions in your body that are and it has to be consistent between people from all races from all ages yeah yeah <laughs> i'm yeah so like i will get into that with very, the trials no but i'm saying it's threading yeah. a very tiny needle that yes efficacy and and toxicity well, 
you're starting with thousands of compounds and ending up with one. So there's definitely a lot that just won't work. So you'll start by growing it in cells, seeing how it reacts to cells. And you'll be doing like your physical chemistry. You're looking at like melting point, boiling point, those sorts of things and how it interacts with other chemicals. And then you'll do more, you'll keep doing more optimization for that. And then before you can study it in a human, you need to do a few different studies um, involving like safety, like does it affect, is affecting organs. Um, and you'll have to do genotoxicity and immunotoxicity studies. So basically you're making sure it doesn't cause cancers or severe immune reactions. Um, and how do you, you, how do you do that without putting it inside a person? Animals. So, this is so you, it is also required that you do doses in at least two species. Um, but you will do, and you can also do them just in groups of cells. So you can just grow like cells in a dish and then see how it changes. That can that can work for a lot of the toxicity studies. What kind but of cells are these? Is this just like repurposed stem cells going into some tissue? Pretty much. Sometimes they're like they're they're human cells, so they're based on like either like humans human immortal cell lines or something. Like it it depends on exactly what you're trying to do. Um it's so and low cost, though. They can, they can really do it to mice and chimps and stuff at the same time. Because, like, one vial yeah. of blood, you put that into, like, a hundred Petri dishes, and then you're mm -hmm. just plotting a hundred different things to see which ones work. Eliminate 50 of them, double up, and do it again. But, like, there's yeah, just there, there's order that you have to do it. So you have to do, like, each step. Like, you can't jump ahead on, on a lot of them, because you have to confirm each step before you move on. Um, but like we haven't even gotten into the fate, into the trials yet. So this is all preclinical. So once you get to a point and you have to do some sort of pharmacokinetic modeling. So what I'm talking about, pharmacokinetics is kind of like how the drug goes through your body from when you take it in to when you get rid of it, how that works, what it's doing. The movement um, there's a lot of math involved. <laughs> yes. Um, and you're going to do some modeling with that based on like specific lab tests and computational analysis that's fairly complicated. So I don't really understand it well enough to get into it in detail. But so by the time you've done all that preclinical development, at that point, you can start doing phase one trials. So you'd still have to like submit. You, you can't just start it on your own. You have to like submit to authorities to be able to, and you have to be tracked about what you're doing. And you have to to do these studies, you have to like say what you're doing before you can do it. You can't just do stuff and then write about it after. That's bad science. So in your phase one trials, these are in normal, healthy adults, not people with the specific disease you're looking for, just normal, healthy people, which probably are just people working at the lab, to be honest. Um, but um, so in these studies, what you're looking for is... And you start by giving them like really tiny doses. So you estimate what kind of dose a human might have based on how it behaved in other animals and some of your computational analyses. Um, start by giving one person a really, really low dose. Give them time, see how it works, see how they clear it. You might like be measuring drug levels in urine and blood and that sort of thing um, to just see how the levels go. And then, so you start with like that super low dose and it's probably not going to do anything. So you move the dose up slowly until you get to a dose that like starts to find toxicity i guess so you you find your like relative dosing ranges so in this study there's no placebos because you're just studying it in healthy adult volunteers so at this point if you get like some crazy toxicity your whole process is probably going to be halted and that drug is just probably never going to be used in humans so everything is quite closely watched at this point so once you pass your phase one trial, you've written it out, you like made a paper, like it's a publishable paper, and you've submitted it to the FDA or Health Canada or the EU Drug Regulation Group, which I forget what they're called, um, or wherever you want to sell it, then you can move on to your phase two trials. So you... Is that, sorry, is that a requirement that it be submitted for publication or does it actually have to get published? It doesn't actually have to get published, but it needs to be... Um, you do have to submit. So, so one of the reasons like why they available or something or what? I, I don't. I don't actually know a hundred percent if it's publicly available. I think it usually is, and I think you could probably find them if you tried. What would happen if you? So there's all these like the 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 U.S. is 
probably the US and the EU and Canada are probably Japan and all of them too are also have these like rigorous um methods to like kind of enforce the scientific method upon this uh, mm-hmm. thing and to minimize the harm done to people mm-hmm. um what like what's stopping a um a company from just going to an unregulated place and and doing tests there like paying uh, off some banana republic the, the thing is is that you can't make very much money doing that but like you can save money and time and then take your results back to the states and be like Look. your results won't your results have to meet their standards and if the fda saw that you like tried to do all your tests in a banana republic as you called it they'll throw it out immediately like okay. you have to play the game to get it approved and the game is very expensive and it should um, be we've verifiable only... too like if you yeah. can reproduce it then it really doesn't matter what source you came from because other people yeah. confirm it who are reputable well, and, and like do, if the risk. fda doesn't like it you might have to redo stuff like that's or like rewrite things or do more math or whatever like they can definitely reject stuff and they do for sure or they can like conditionally reject so like well you we can will, you run the you risk know? of like doing mangala science and uh hmm. he's like well it, we we found this out well how did you find it out well through human suffering and it's just like yeah <laughs> yeah the they, yeah well, the other companies would probably because uh, they're competing there's companies competing with each other right and i forgot about this yeah and yeah, so there are. like if one company steps out of line the other ones will be happy to uh throw them under the bus absolutely they will yeah and this also like can be affected by other policies like for instance when they were doing the covid vaccines they were letting them submit paperwork for more than one like they were letting them start phase two trials like while they were still finishing the phase one paperwork just to speed it along um they were still making them like show preliminary results but they didn't need to have like everything done in like now you do phase one okay we now we have to look at phase one for three months okay we approved phase one now you can move on to phase two like they kind of like sped up some of the bureaucracy in that process and that's why those vaccines got approved quicker um yeah so once you're done phase two every or sorry phase one everything's been approved you can move on to phase two so phase two is the first time that you're using your drug in the correct patient population so we you might in my example earlier for we found a new target in the liver for a drug and we're so now we're going to be giving it to people with liver damage so and we will again be looking at how the drug goes in their body. So like we'll take blood tests every hour and collect urine. And um, you're gonna start to look at some points of how well it works, but at this point you're still looking mostly for toxicity and appropriate dosing. So, and this is done in like 30 to 100 people usually, um, whereas phase one is usually done in like 20 people, not very many. Um, so then you can do your phase two, you'll do your write up, you'll submit it, get that approved. Now you can move on to phase three. So phase three is our randomized controlled trial, double blind, all those, all that. This is the most expensive trial totally because it's very, very complicated to set up. Um, so this, you're having your placebo control. So you will give people, and sometimes with, um, RCTs, randomized control trials, you'll have more than one dose. So you'll have like a high dose and a low dose of your drug. If you're not sure what the correct dose should be or what to use when. So you might um, have three groups that's like placebo and your drug at a low dose and your drug at a high dose, or it could just be placebo and your new drug. And what you're looking for in RCTs is mostly, does it work? You are still going to be following adverse effects. You're still going to be following like, um, like toxicity, things and anything else that's going on but the main point of your phase three trial is does this drug work better than placebo because and you're looking for statistically significant answers so these are like usually coming out of multiple centers they usually try to do them in several cities try to get different patient populations like oftentimes you're restricted to like one country but um you try to like get different types of people so that you're not like only giving drugs to one specific population because then you can't really say it'll work in a different population so um, is that also where they look at interactions too or interactions they they deal with that throughout i believe like or that just comes up as they come up maybe they just yeah and like oftentimes the uh phase three trials will exclude people on certain medications so 
like if you say you're on an anticonvulsant because they interact with a lot of things, then you'll probably be excluded for from phase three, three trials for new diabetes medications because you just don't want those confounders in it. So um, usually the, the, they try and like the way that you pick your population can sort of inform how it's going as well. Um, I can get into that a little bit more, but you're, you're trying to pick like a population. Generally, you're trying to pick one that has your disease, the disease you're looking for, and only that disease, which isn't also super realistic because most people have, especially people that are older, they'll have like four or five medical conditions and they interact with each other. So then if you find, if you did a trial and it's in people with just heart failure, but not diabetes, then maybe the heart failure medications make the diabetes worse. Maybe the diabetes medications make the heart failure worse. So those are things that can be um, sometimes co only come out after drugs on the market, but yeah, point so is sampling and yeah. dem demographics is really like it's forefront of my studies, basically <laughs> with all and, data science. Yeah, and um, you like you would know that like there's when you're prescribing a new drug and you see oh they didn't actually test this in people over 75 years old, and you got an 86 year old patient that seems like they might qualify. You might either really hesitate to use that or maybe start it at the lowest dose and move it up slowly or maybe just choose something else because you can't really say like if they only studied it in people 50 to 75 with this one condition well if your person's 48 and has four medical conditions like is it really going to work so that's stuff that usually comes out post-marketing um, and representative sampling is really key to interpreting the data too. So while you're mm -hmm. writing and publishing information, mm -hmm. um, ideally you'd be writing in something that's not um, uh, it's not pre pre deciding or prejudicing their own outcomes. Ideally, yeah. you'd have a publication that states pretty clearly what they expect there to be from interactions, just based on groups and classifications of drugs too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you when but you're what happens, doing, go ahead. Oh, sorry, but I was going to say, what happens when it's the company sponsoring their own research for the for the trials? Well, the like, company how, how is we... generally doing their own research, but you do want them. You do have to. There's a point where you have to state, like, "Hey, I'm Pfizer, and I'm doing research on this new drug I'm developing. I'm paying people to do research on my drug. This is a thing." So you have to be like very open about that. The other thing you have to do is for a trial to be like sort of recognized nowadays, you need to post what you're doing before you do it. So you're going to say like, we are going to go to these centers. We're going to do the double blinding like this. We are going to like measure these outcomes. We're going to look for these adverse effects, but like have this form for patients to fill out after two months to see how they're doing. And we're going to, so you have to specify every piece of what you're doing before you do it. So you can't halfway through go, you know what, if we use this measure, not this measure, then it looks like it works better. Like you can't do that. You have to say what measures you're going to use before you start. So that helps a lot. How do they call out that implicit bias, though? Like, I and I say this because I'm constantly hearing about them violating the public trust in this precise way. But I can't tell if that's because I'm hearing about it more because the news is everywhere and just scandal, 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 or if it's actually happening more. But like, that this has been happening since um, like tobacco and alcohol come and like seat belts on cars, like. Companies have constantly throughout history been producing fake science just to serve their own interests. Well, and that's why we have a rigorous approval process like we do. And that's why we like make people post the results and we make people declare conflicts of interest. So say you did do a study and you found out that, you know, someone was being funded by, you know, Pfizer, or that's the first drug company I can think of because of the COVID vaccine, and um, the and you don't declare that, then your study might be invalidated. Or like every time that study is mentioned, it'll be like this study had problems. Like, and even if you go into like medical literature and pharmacy literature for that, I would use now for like there's a new drug and someone got prescribed it. I'm gonna learn about it so I know what to tell them about it. They'll have notes in there being like, yeah, this trial wasn't done very well, so you might not be able to trust this result. And we're, we learn to look for that stuff. So right. if you are good at your job as a pharmacist and as a doctor, 
then you should be able to spot when things are My... not quite right. And you should use it according to how it was tested. So my thought is, is that because there's, there's another problem with this process that's come up and it's probably been patched in the latest um, update. But um, <laughs> the, the thing that comes to mind was a properly done study uh, done unethically, um, specifically like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment where they you know, did the study, but then the people that had adverse effects, so they brought in people um, with the disease and then they didn't do anything for the people that got in the controlled trials. So they just, you know, they, they, they cured a bunch of people and then they just left the rest with syphilis and said, well, whatever, you know, they, when they could have just said, oh, this works. Let's yes. So they, there, like, there is like another big point with, um, with that where you don't, there are places where it is not appropriate to have a placebo at all. So okay. a lot or of times phase three trials, them. Yeah, like a lot of times phase three trials, they'll do like you get three months on the placebo and then three months with the drug or something, or you don't get a placebo at all and you're comparing it to another drug that's already on the market. So for like the new agents to the, the newer like direct anticoagulants, um, that you can't just not anticoagulate somebody if they have atrial fibrillation and they had a stroke because their chance of having a stroke is so high that it is unethical to just have a placebo group when you're trying a new drug for that. So you'll like, compare it to something that you know it works. So someone's either getting a new drug or the old drug that we know works. Something where if you gave them a placebo, there's no chance to give them to them after like, oh, we have a Ebola vaccine. Well, let, let's get a control group together. No, because the control group would literally, you just literally be- You're the, killing them. You're killing yeah. them. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, that's yeah, it's like, do we actually know that parachutes work? Like we, in order to know that parachutes work, we have to put a bunch of people at the plane and some people get parachutes and some people don't. And we push them all out of the plane and see how many people survive. Like, no, you can't do that. You attach it to a rock. <laughs> No, people. You have to do it with people. Like, but my my point is that you can't you always use a placebo. But there yeah. seems to be a really heavy reliance on people um, judging other people's studies, and I don't think that's actually been happening. Um, like statins are a perfect example. There's still controversy out there between PhD professionals about how the the data were collected and and interpreted. So, on on the one hand, they said something like. Um, uh, people with diabetes, if they took a statin daily for four years, had a 48% reduced risk of stroke. But that reduced risk was being translated in absolute terms rather than relative terms. So like the real risk changes from 28 in 1,000 down to 15 in 1,000. But the risk of harm from the statins was actually higher than that. But they reported so, that in the study in absolute terms instead of relative terms to yes. make the harm look bigger. And they make the relative risk of relative upside. risks always Small. look relative risks look bigger because you can say like yeah stat reduces your risk of a heart attack by 50 percent. it's like well what's my regular risk of a heart attack 0. 0.001 it's like okay then what's yeah. the point in me taking this and like that's definitely a one percent increase in a risk yeah. for a one for a half percent to decrease in a risk like it's not yeah it, that's not worth it doing this they're pushing this <laughs> like it's gospel today so i'm wondering like if our only system and process is to judge people based on they're known to be biased science, which is already a bad starting point, in my opinion, because you're starting from something that's in, like the people only get to do their jobs if they have funding and they only have funding if the company keeps paying for the research they want to see. Like the system itself seems really stupid. There is uh, there's definitely some sketchy things. Um, I'll bring you another example. It's the hormone therapy in women. So in the early 2000s, there was an st observational study that came out that was saying that hormone therapy in women can reduce the risk of heart attack. It was observational, so it wasn't controlled. They were just looking at women that were using hormone therapy and saw that they have a lower risk of heart attack than women that weren't using hormone therapy. So, of course, people jump on this right away. They start producing hormone therapy. They start giving it out because it was, it was there already, but it was changing the way it was being used. So now it was being used. They were giving it to like every women, woman postmenopausal like and but then they actually started to find that it was causing heart attacks. So what's going on? Um, and drug companies were pushing doing this as well because they want people to buy their drug because they want to make money. 
And um, what the actual issue is, is hormone therapy is, is in the original study. You have a group of women who were taking hormone therapy who were in general more healthy, more cared more about their like personal fitness and personal health and generally had a bit more money because you had to pay for it. And so, yeah, these women had less heart attacks than the other women, but it was not because of the drug. It was because of the other reasons. So that's kind of where that stemmed from. But what we found out is that if you start hormone therapy, either during menopause or within the first few years after menopause, then it is protective against heart attacks. But if you start it more than 10 years after a woman's in menopause, then it will increase the risk of heart attack quite a bit. So we had to find that out. But it resulted in a lot of women getting a, getting a therapy that they shouldn't have been on for quite a while. So in coming back to our last episode where we had a system that was both corporate self-interested and public interested, then it works really well. What's the difference between the drug industry, which is right next door to them, it's right on their doorstep, and the drug <laughs> industry is the exact opposite. It's like the epitome of corporate corruption. The in America. thing is, like is... Corporate espionage and... The th like spies. <laughs> the thing is, is that a lot of the issues aren't exactly from Big Pharma itself, but they're from America's system of healthcare. Where so in in America, if you're a community pharmacy, you have to negotiate with every single insurance company what is going to be covered and how. So you will have like 150, 200 contracts with different insurance companies to determine who gets what and how much they pay for it. So if someone comes in and they're getting five milligrams of Ramapril, they pay their $21 and they go out and the person behind them picks up their five milligrams of Ramapril, they pay $42. Why? Because you negotiated a different contract with a different insurance company. And that's not really fair. In Canada, everyone that's on five milligrams of Ramapril gets charged the same amount. I mean, they can have secondary insurance or Blue Cross or whatever, and that can cover some of it, but the price of the drug doesn't change. Um, and there's a lot of corruption in the States between the pharmaceutical companies and the people dispensing and selling drugs. And there's a and the lot of middlemen. Companies. There's so many middlemen in the States as well. So they have a drug might be in the hands of like two or three, four companies before it gets to yours. Whereas in Canada, for the most part, you have a drug distribution company that buys directly from the manufacturers and then sells it directly to community pharmacies. That's usually how it works here. So you're cutting out some of the middlemen. Um, America has like all these this crazy corruption in between. And they've even got sales associates and marketing yeah. managers, and they go on golf retreats to try and coax doctors into prescribing more of their own medications. And and yeah. like insurance companies are just as bad because what they're doing is they're saying <laughs> we'll agree to overpay you on this one medication for X amount of time in return for money. The government's saying no. we'll allow it through the FDA in return for money. The credit department that's looking after the shareholders and the corporate stock is like paid for by the corporation themselves. Like literally the company is sustaining the entire uh, government. Well, that's the problem is that their, their reach is too far. Like they shouldn't have that much power but it's to so determine all that. It like that. Like pharmacies are right next to them and they're doing the exact opposite, emphasizing customer service, due diligence, triple because, check. Because, well, because <laughs> pharmacists are people and why do people become pharmacists? Because they failed to get into med school. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> to help because, uh, to, because they want to help you. I, that, that's a self <laughs> No, it was a good joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure people knew I didn't take you seriously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the it's because you want to do something to help people generally. Like some people do it because like mommy and daddy are paying for it. So I might as well. Um, and some people do it because like, yeah, pharmacy is a good job, whatever. But for the most part, people, you don't go into pharmacy if you don't care at all. Like you... You need to have some, like, empathy towards people. You want to help ease people's suffering. That's why you do this job. So people that are pharmacists will try to be ethical about it, generally. Of course, there's always people that, you know, throw out COVID vaccines or sell narcotics on the side. But for the most part, pharmacists usually have that, like, enlightened way of looking. Because that's what they set out to do. I mean, maybe that's naive and people get burnt out pretty quickly when you're working for a company and they want you to do a billion things and you see so many people coming in and you're like, you can, you can get burnt out and 
and cynical. Are but... these companies on the same like college of surgeons and college of pharmacists? Like, are they also involved in the same way pharmacists are in, in setting regulations? Not really. And... They can set things like workflow. They can set things like um, what they want you, the way that Storage. they want you to work and do certain things. Um, and they do negotiate. They definitely negotiate with provincial and federal government for things, for changes and changes in funding and things like that. Yeah, they definitely like have power on the government level and some influence, which like, I don't think that's a- exceptionally wrong as long as it's not too out of control. Like you do want them to have a say because they are the companies, but you also don't want them yeah, to determine health, everything, right? right? <laughs> like they're, and like they do have a good, like it's, it's a better balance in Canada than the States where it's, it's just like all these middlemen and it's insane. Um, but <laughs> Um, if you don't, yeah. What's really crazy to me is like the UK is similar to Canada, but they're so much more dysfunctional than we are that it costs them almost as much. The, as the, the UK States. also Not like quite. has a drug benefit program. Um, so you there's like a maximum to the amount you can pay for drugs. Um, the thing with once you get programs like that, where you end up having more like bureaucracy too, but also like, oh, we can't give you the expensive drug until you try these three cheap drugs first, and then it wastes yeah. everyone's time. Um, and that's one of the stockpile because the next well, year they might have to save up for a couple months before they can pay their copays and stuff. Like, yeah, and like uh, one of the there is a couple advantages to the American healthcare, which is like, say you have like. I don't know, like psoriasis or something. So one of the best, one of the better treatments for psoriasis is a biologic, which is, it's an antibody. They're expensive to make. They're not, they're more complicated, newer drugs, and they can cost like thousands of dollars a month. So say you have good insurance and you're American and you just got psoriasis and you really want it to go away. It's really bothering you. It's itchy. It's cracked. It's in a spot that's visible. So you're really embarrassed or whatever. You can just go and straight to that biologic drug and just be like, yeah, I want that one. And they can give you an expensive drug like that. Whereas if you're somewhere like Canada and you're on like a coverage program, a lot of times they'll have rules. So like, no, you have to try these drugs first and you have to do a round of steroids and you have to try as a thiaprine and whatever else. But if you can afford list. it, you so, can pay for it up front. And then if it works, you can have your doctor yeah, suggest outright. It definitely like, depends. If it's, yeah. if it's important to the person, they can do it. Yeah. You just have to put um, one month up front, maybe three months yeah, up Yeah, but like, no, what? Like, I mean, if you have so much money that paying, you know, fifteen thousand dollars a year for a drug means nothing to you then you can do that but most people are well, not most there drugs aren't that expensive though That's yeah a small i'm talking of well biologics are becoming huge like humera is like very largely prescribed um at a but little also, amount, so. like i don't know I, I i sort of read some of the, the 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 research on that too and like a lot of the it seems like they're doing the same thing with their research they're cherry picking the way they present the data even in their own publications because like the risk mm-hmm. from humera for infection is way understated it's just it quickly is. rattled off at the end of a commercial they tell everybody to ask their doctor for well like- and <laughs> the thing is like we uh, like i have some experience starting people on these drugs and you have to go through a whole bunch of tests before you can do it like they're looking at like they're doing blood counts looking at your liver function they're looking they do like a whole screen of diseases like tuberculosis hiv hepatitis um, all the types of hepatitis and like they're they're like do like chest x-rays and they do like all sorts of workup before you can go on it but like the the thing is is that there's usually a risk benefit thing going on here like by the time you're getting to that point your whatever disease you have is probably affecting your life to a point that you're willing to put up with some risk and like every drug is risk benefit every single drug has risks and benefits and you have to weigh them and see what's what's there and you need to look at what's most important to the patient and weigh that and i mean it's that's more of a small scale thing but like what like from my small scale step like most of what i'm doing to help with because like i know there's corruption in the pharmaceutical industry but what i'm trying to do is stay informed on where it is so that i can say like yes i know this drug was sponsored by its company entirely and its study wasn't great but I'm aware of that and I might use it with restrictions. So I might not jump to it first. First, I might use it only if the other drugs don't work. And I might not use it in a certain group because 
well, there was actually a couple people that had like kidney failure during the trial and no one was talking about that. So maybe I won't use it in my patient with that's had diabetes for 15 years and I know their kidney function is declining, right? Like you, yeah. you're trying to be smart about it as well, the are like, you even allowed smaller to say person. That? As a pharmacist, are you allowed to say, well, your doctor yeah. probably didn't oh. tell you this because he's getting a kickback under the table? Well, that doesn't, I, that doesn't, <laughs> I mean, as far maybe, as I know, people, that doesn't happen. You can say something like but, that should happen. But, Why would my doctor suggest this? Well, he might've got a coupon, but that's true. Well, he might've gotten an inducement. To well, and like you can, doctors can get samples as well. So they'll give someone like two weeks or a month of a supply of a drug. But are you allowed to works. step on their toes like that? Like, oh yeah, because it's Absolutely. true. Absolutely, because it's evidence. You yeah. you can you can do that if you have someone walks up to you and says, and they have a drug and they're like, "This drug I can't take with grapefruit," and you look at it and you go, "Yeah, you can." And they're like, "But my doctor told me you can go." Like, no, your doctor probably got it mixed up. Like, it was good of him to like try to be aware of what was going on, but like at this point, yeah, you can do that. So like, yeah, you are supposed to. And like, we are definitely encouraged if we see a doctor doing something sketchy, that's not following guidelines or not following the evidence that we were taught. And they're just doing stuff that's weird. We are definitely taught to be like, yo, what's going on? Mm -hmm. What are you yeah. doing? Why are you doing Safety that? first. Like, it's like, yes, mm -hmm. the patient is most important, but we need to be evidence-based. And that's like very highly emphasized because evidence-based doesn't mean just like blindly following studies. It also means looking at studies with judgment and with skepticism. I mean, it's hard though. It's really hard to do that. I can sit here and be like, yeah, I'm so skeptical. But like, how many times do I just go, uh, yeah, uh, good enough. Okay. Yeah. That but looks right. Like so same, you, you got to try to be a better person. At the really. same time you like, you can, you can make any assertion, but you have to back it up. And that's where I think it stands is mm -hmm. if you have a thought and you go to your little, database of information in your head or on your computer or your notes and you find uh some actual evidence that supports it but if you can't then well there's nothing there and mm -hmm. so if you have a reason to believe that then there's an argument to be made there one thing i don't really get is why like you know you get doctors getting kickbacks and stuff and prescribing stuff they can just say no <laughs> like yeah but they, like what's are they being like yeah like you 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 a dump truck of money backed up on someone's lawn is pretty persuasive um and it that's is. probably one of the places where i don't get money out of like pharmaceutical politics but at the same time a doctor worth his salt could still like it's like oh that was a very nice steak dinner or lunch that you got me it's too bad that i'm not going to do anything about your drug i'm i'll take a look at it but i'm not going to pro, i'm not going to over prescribe it more than I mm -hmm. see necessary. And the pharmacist can do that too. When a sales rep comes up, they can just be like, that's nice. I will take your free, I will take your free cap and uh, not do anything else. And yeah, yeah. that's no, that, and that you like, can politely say, I'll look into it. Yes. You, that's you my favorite phrase. Kickback and not do anything. <laughs> I don't know why that's like, yeah, they're um, very good at guilt and manipulation. Maybe I don't know. Maybe and it's just there's a lot of weak pharmacists. There, there might also be. be like, oh, no. There's a bit of a, all my friends are doing it. So, um, and well, I was going to prescribe that drug to my patients anyway, so I might as well get extra money for it. Like you could definitely okay. rationalize it. Like say, like there's some cases where you can prescribe like one of five drugs, and they're all pretty similar and they're all pretty much like work they're, they're all like pretty much equally going to be effective they might be slightly different and so if you've got an incentive from one then you'll be like okay well i guess i'll just go to that one first and i was going to prescribe them a drug like this anyway and them being on this one versus this one doesn't really make a difference so if i take an incentive for this then i can just go with that like it's not impossible to imagine why they're doing it yeah i I'm, i tend to be a bit of, i tend to be a bit disagreeable and a so a bit yeah so <laughs> if someone tells me to do something i'm i'll i'll, I'll question it because it's just uh, i'll be like who the heck are you and i'll be like it could be even like a family member i'll be like why should <laughs> but like yeah. um mm -hmm. so like i can imagine myself doing that but like a not all people are made equal and you know you get a 
pharmacist or doctor who goes through their thing not caring they don't really even want to be there all they want to be doing is playing video games or something and they make it through and it's not about the patient it's about you know just them getting through the day or something yeah but, um or they become like dated it's or they become you know some yeah. house of god stuff but well but, you get cynical you're more likely to say yeah. like yeah whatever i'll just take it who cares like all my friends are doing it everyone here is doing it Which and is, like that's... my buddy dr smith just bought a new lamborghini so i want one too um <laughs> but that's why i say like you like that's why the medical fa not facilities but medical training um regime that they put all of you guys through is mm -hmm. like they need to have that almost symbolic ethic like woven into everything like the doc doctors do with their hippocratic oath which everyone yeah. is cynical about but it's there for a reason yeah <laughs> and our, our thing was like all like be patient-centered patient-centered care i don't think we could go five minutes in a class without saying patient-centered care like that was mm -hmm. always at the center of everything and that's important and that's like, why we talk about it so much. So um, there are also some like less obvious ways of like obviously dumping that truckload of cash on their front lawn and then them rationalizing it away is a pretty straightforward and clear example. But things like the DSM, the way the D the diagnostics the manual for mental health illnesses, I don't know what it stands for. But the DSM manual is like, yeah. It diagnoses mental conditions such as restless leg syndrome and and depression and and one of the biggest businesses right now is antidepressants just for an example um oh, so when well, you've got a manual that's being written by people who are writing the science for the industry then the manual is basically being written by the companies selling the drugs to cure those illnesses well my the, thing, the thing with the, the okay go ahead my Jordan. thing with the dsm is that like you mentioned restless leg if i just like i i fidget a lot so i could probably i could probably come up randomly i consider myself a very very healthy individual i do have a few things that um i could get i don't know but if i really tried and went to the doctor and went through the dsm i could probably find like 25 things that i have and be like i'm a mess and it that's what my problem is with it is that it's this thing that allows you to define any like all these behaviors that you want you can become this victim or you can become this so it's like oh i need antidepressants like Rather and than... you're supposed to kind of take some of it with a grain of salt and the point with the dsm jordan's right like if you right. look at any person sometimes if you look at any person on the planet and you took them aside and interviewed them you could diagnose them with stuff in the dsm 100 percent. every That's single exactly person on the planet point, and but they're basing that the manual point off of the, the 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 research that's done by the company selling the drugs to fix the problem so i mean the companies still do have to follow the rigor that we talked about at the beginning, but yeah, I can see your point. But like the other point with the DSM is there's always, um, here, here's a couple points. Not everything in the DSM is treatable with drugs. A lot of things are just like, go to therapy. But the other point is that the DSM basically always has a clause that people ignore, which is how badly is it affecting their life? So let's say that you, you know, you have insomnia, which can be a sign of depression. So you're not sleeping well and you've been gaining weight the last few months. And, you know, you could, it could be any reason at all that that could be happening. And technically it would fit under depression, but is it actually really affecting your life? Cause that's what it means. But if somebody comes up to you and says, I think I might be depressed. Then you, then a lot of times that will just be taken as, oh yeah, that's affecting their life. Check, but like that, that's a point. And like, but it also doesn't really mean anything. There's so much gray language in the DSM. Like, ev like it's supposed to be this, like, yeah, if you just have to follow this point and this point and one of these points, but it's all so relative, like. So it's well, it's full of obscure charts and things too, like questionnaires and how to diagnose it. And a lot of these doctors who don't have, you know, history background in psychiatry, psychology, and neurology, they mm -hmm. can't possibly know anything more than what the DSM says. And one of the, the other DSM issues is that psychiatry is not nearly as well studied as any other, as like other branches of medicine. And the reason is because it's hard. Like, how do you measure if someone's depression is 
is improved. You have to come up with like questionnaires, which sometimes aren't always great. And so why make a manual that recommends treatment options for stuff that you haven't diagnosed or fit treatments for? The, the the you're not supposed to give treatments until they like get to a certain point. Like someone is diagnosed with mild depression, technically you're not supposed to prescribe them an uh, antidepressant right away. You're supposed to try therapy and like diet and exercise and like you know all these other like other things before you go into therapy. But like, does that happen? Probably not. Someone sits down in a doctor's appointment for twenty minutes and says, you know, I have been feeling really depressed recently, and they're just like, here's your sertraline. Bye. So they, um, it's, and like depression as well. Like you really actually need to be a lot more supportive than just handing someone a drug and just being like, this will make you feel better. Bye. Like that never works. Or in like a month, but like, yeah, well, it takes a month to do anything. DSM is a, like, it's, it's essentially just an encyclopedia. Um, but it, it, they, it's the, the, the conceit of it, I think answer Chris's question was that, the conceit is that psychologists know what they're doing and the whole point of psychiatry is to work slowly through these things which we really can't define because everyone's got these demons on their back that really need to be worked with um, in a long form. You can't just be like, oh, this is this. And you, when you – these labels for anyone on the ground uh, – don't haven't seemed to be very useful because you know restless leg syndrome oh what's the treatment for that and the other thing it does is it the 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 profession in psychology becomes um defining instead of um treatment and definitions though it's nice to have a little book on your shelf it doesn't actually do much beyond well you have this oh it's good to know that i have that now that doesn't actually fix the problem at all. Well, and I think people might are and you could rely be using on the definition, wrong. and yeah, oh yeah, and it's 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 a it's like hmm, how do I put this? It's like when you're trying to if you want to you know plant a bunch of trees, and then you get a botany manual uh, with all the list of all the trees, and you're like, I'm an expert on trees now. And what you all you have is the definitions of all the types of trees. You still need to know how to grow all the trees and how to prune them properly, how to what kind of fertilizer and soil and environment they need. It's it could well it's all in there, but no, you need the actual. But I'm not splitting hairs here. Like if you actually read the DSM, it's full of absolute nonsense. And I just oh, pulled up a random page here. I could read out just just as an example. Uh, conduct disorder changes from the DSM four to the DSM five manual. It's the exact same thing, a repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which basic rights of others or major age-appropriate societal norms or rules are violated, as manifested by the presence of three or more of the following criteria in the past 12 months, with at least one criterion present in the last six months. It's very, very specific, as if we know what this thing is. Right, and and there's all this. When you have an encyclopedia, you can just define anything. Hold on, this is just a change from one version (laughs) to the next. It's not even adding a new entry. Yeah. There's a list that's three pages long describing conduct disorder, which is itself not even a diagnosable, it's an abstract grouping of non-diagnosable things. And the research they're using to draw from all of this is sponsored by the drug companies who invented a chemical and decided they needed to find a place to sell it. They needed a market. So it's like so the you're, conflict you're of interest to me a, couldn't um, be any clearer. Oh, okay, yeah. It's more of a catalog than an encyclopedia. Yeah, it's not at all an encyclopedia. Well, I'd, like, in my opinion, the, the, it's they're, straight up they're just, just marketing material. They're, yeah, they're giving you terms to define a disorder, but like you're supposed to have enough sense as a physician or a prescriber to know that just because somebody fits the criteria for depression doesn't mean that they should be starting on an antidepressant today. But like that's not obvious, and it you're right. It is kind of presented in a way that's not. You need to know how to use it, and you need to know when it's appropriate to use and when it's not. So you've, and it might help you if you are, say, a psychiatrist and you're doing some sort of therapy. Um, it might help you to like put names on things so that you know what you need to address and what you need to help this patient with, so that they can become more functional or improve how they're living their life. But like 
you need to know that it's just a tool to do some things and some things are silly. Like there's but something that we brought that up. Too. We brought up um, oppositional defiant disorder, which is what I refer to as anarchy disorder. And it's just kids that aren't listening and are like, no, mom, I won't do that. And I'm like, well, how is this a disorder? Like, like that's just, <laughs> that's just being disagreeable and, or like, no, mom, I don't want to. Like, why is this a disorder? That doesn't make any like sense. Every teenager goes through the, like, <laughs> F you, I won't do what you tell me phase. Yeah, right? And but like, I think where it's really harmful, and this is what I wanted to get to, is because the flip side of that is just as bad. When the doctors don't know, like, anything about, um, say, drugs, like opioids or something like that, or, mm -hmm. and you go to your doctor and tell them about a street drug you're doing, and they just have no clue what they're what they're talking about and they look it up in a manual and they don't think twice about it and do you know what i mean like the other yeah, like thing, that's, like, that's that's absolutely not helping you microdosing mdma to treat your ptsd just because they want to believe it not because they checked it not because of a manual not because of research so there's research going the other way that has to prove that it works fair enough so yeah. they're not doing the same diligence on the opposite end of the spectrum looking for alternative treatments for their their patients and that to me is just as much a problem because you're relying on these gospel written in stone manuals as opposed to science. So but like the thing is, drug companies, doctors, drug dealers, <laughs> doctor, like we are taught in our classes that guidelines are not the Bible. They're they're written by people and they usually say they're conflicts of interest, but like sometimes they're kind of weird. And we like there is basically like, yes, we want evidence, but there's basically nothing that's like 100 percent true that we know. So we are supposed to be looking at self skepticism. And if you are good at your job as a prescriber, that's what you should be doing, too. But if you're not good at your job, it's very easy to fall into these traps. But that, to me, um, is the point of the medical license. It's to prevent people who are uninformed from getting their own prescriptions, and it's to ensure that people giving prescriptions are well-informed. If the exactly, people yeah. aren't able to get their own prescription, like a microdose of LSD for, to treat their PTSD, just because their doctor doesn't believe in it, the <laughs> opposite problem is happening from the system that's supposedly there to protect the patient. Like the ignorant okay. doctor is just as dangerous as the doctor who's uh, who's not there. Yeah, uh, like the person and, off the street getting their own prescriptions. Yeah, and like you need to be open about, but like it's really hard because like micro like, and it's been shown that like um, using like psilocybin for people with depression, um, doing it in a controlled circumstance, basically like hallucinating with a therapist but the therapist yeah. like talks you through your issues and there's like a specific thing that they do and they like they don't get them like crazy messed up or anything no just no they're just them bring them bit. bring them to a point where they can think about and like it's especially useful in ptsd because you need to and that's why they use mdma for that too is like mm -hmm. you bring them to a point where they can think about the traumatic experience and talk about it in a way that they can actually do that without breaking down. Without and then the that intensity. can help them heal. That can help them heal from it. So there is some evidence, but like the drugs are still technically illegal, right? So we're it that now it's an issue of slow bureaucracy at this point but and again, needing not better evidence. Because of, of data. They're illegal just because people decided to believe in yeah. something before looking into it. Because drugs the wanted no more studies on drugs. Is because it was illegal to procure it, not because yeah. nobody wanted to study it. Yeah. Like and preventing medicine is stupid. Well, I think one of the <laughs> yes. funny things that used to happen in Canada, at least, was when you were able to get medicinal marijuana and everyone would know a doctor that would be um, – there was almost like an underground list of <laughs> like – doctors that would just be like yeah let's give you here you, you you want glaucoma you got glaucoma here's some weed go go have fun and um but there was other ones who like were i guess um what's the word i'm looking for um sympathetic to um cannabis use and they would be like well of course this isn't a bad thing so i'm going to i'm going to give you a go and then people actually did need it but that was um a judgment call on the the part of the doctor and that came around to it so like a lot of times it's the it's the um the like if you get a bad doctor you can go get an uh um a different doctor and you know get a second opinion if you're if you're in a country that's like there is one doctor in this country and you must use the doctor and he's gonna you know 
like, but a bad doctor is somebody who enables your addiction. Yes. So you're going to want to see a bad doctor if you're an addict. You're going to want that more than anything else in the world. Right. You can't so, put that on the patient. And doctors That's why are the just... opioid crisis became a crisis. Mm-hmm. Do you guys do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, let's move on to that. <laughs> Okay. Well, first, the difference between opiates and opioids, because I think a lot of people get that confused. <laughs> I do. I'm. Um. Or is that is? Okay. I'm, oh wait. well, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Opiates go. Opiates is just like the the natural. Uh, oh, it's that. Okay. Occurring <laughs> alkaloids that are in the plant that causes the production. So that's like a it's an amalgamation of like morphine and whatever else is in opium. But like when you refine it into something like just the morphine or just the heroin or just the whatever else or fentanyl uh they call it opioid because it's just mm-hmm. it's all encompassing but opiates is just the natural occurring alkaloid yeah you have like your synthetic semi-synthetic and your more natural ones that's, and yeah. that's yeah that's the difference um but there there has been um a study that was done in 1980 and i'm going to read the entire study to you so sit back relax it'll take 30 seconds okay quote that in the thing so we can link it in the description yeah i'll i'll i will i'll give you the whole thing so this was by porter and jick in 1980 the title of it is addiction rare in patients treated with narcotics it was published in the new england journal of medicine which is a very like highly um that's what i'm looking for Regarded, Prestigious. regarded, At esteemed. Least it used yeah, to be. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it's, pu- pu- yeah, it's done. Had us has post done a lot of important papers in the past. So highly regarded thing. And there was a letter to the editor and I'll read the whole thing. Okay. Recently, we examined our current files to determine the incidence of narcotic addiction in 39,946 hospitalized medical patients who are monitored consecutively. Although there were 11,000 882 patients who received at least one narcotic preparation. There were only four cases of reasonable, well-documented addiction in patients who had no history of addiction. The addiction was considered major in only one instance. The drugs implicated were meperidine in two patients, Percodan in one, and hydromorphone in one. We conclude that despite widespread use of narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. That's it. That's oh, I was whole... waiting for a timeline or something. Nope, nope that's the whole paper. That's so we it. gave it to them once. One. What this was is this was patients who were in a hospital for some reason. They received at least one dose of a narcotic. It could have just been like, hey, you're post-surgery. Here's one day of morphine and then you can go home and do whatever you want. So, And yeah. they didn't follow these patients afterwards. And it was like it wasn't really the intention of the author's for it to be used the way it was, but this paper has been cited hundreds and hundreds of times. So if you ever hear that addictions are in less than 1% of patients, they're referring to this study, which was done in people that were in a controlled circumstance in a hospital that weren't necessarily sent home with opioids to take home, And didn't have access to them afterwards, and the time hadn't gone by for them to get addicted, because you don't just get hooked on the first one that you try. No, no, not you, especially when you're, like, in a hospital, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Where they're, like, it's... It's a controlled circumstance. They're usually not giving you like super crazy high doses because especially if you've never had opioids before, right? But so this study has been cited often. So in Scientific American in 1990, it was called an extensive study. Um, It's called persuasive in places. It's been called a landmark study. And a letter um, to an editor? Yeah. Okay, that's exactly the type of misleading information I'm talking about. So I don't think people actually like had read this. They were just like, yeah, Porter and Jack, 1980, they showed that opioids aren't that addictive. And it got picked up somehow. And there was a lot of pushing to destigmatize opioids. And because that's they the were quite... That's company. That's what they're doing with all their money to make more money. That's, it's not just... The thing is, it's not just the pharmaceutical companies that were doing it. Doctors... Also, where I don't want to blame doctors, but the point is, is that people that become doctors and work in healthcare are people that care and are people that have compassion. So if you have all these patients that come in with this crazy back pain all the time, you want to help them. You want to get rid of that pain for them. And having people tell you that like, you know what, actually the opioids might be okay. You go, oh my God, maybe I can actually help this guy. So 
it's a little bit of naivete, a little bit of ignorance, a little bit of negligence, and people circular citation. And this isn't the only thing that happened. It wasn't only based on this one paragraph, but this is just an example of where things kind of went wrong. And but I would suggest that's very typical because it, not a single year goes by where Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer or Moderna or AstraZeneca or all of these companies get like hundreds of millions of dollars in fines for misleading the public and they just sweep it under the rug and no. pay a fine and they make and money on it hand over fist. It should be like worse because like Apple also lies in every commercial that they put out. Every time yeah. Apple comes up with a new product, they just straight up lie in the commercials and just pay the damages because it's actually, they like write it into their business plan. Like they know that they're going to get sued for their new commercial, yeah. but they're still going to make so much money on their new product that they don't care. So I think the point is that you need to make the punishment fit the crime a little better here. Like but The pharmacy industry or pharmaceuticals industry is very, very similar in the sense that they, they even offer straight out kickbacks to doctors for prescribing them. And they yeah. give them the out saying it's not addictive. Yeah. And that's not right. Or, and then there's no punishment. There's no accountability. That's the worst mm -hmm. part. And like there, there were, yeah. Courts too. There were other papers too that were saying like, yeah, it's fine. But like they weren't quite like it's bad science and people looking at bad science and not really realizing. And like that's why it's hard because like we're taught like don't trust everything but then it's like what can i trust and you go through a crisis but you it's well, a journal editor like a scientific journal should have an editor that criticizes the things that they publish they like, it, like i will magazine used to review their like the editor on this yeah. is issue would talk about articles written in the past issue and mm -hmm. make any corrections or commentary that he thinks was not in yeah line. they would publish and, anything mm -hmm. They think that should happen. There should be more of that. But like, because this paper is just saying that if you give somebody hydromorphone when they're in hospital because they're in pain because they broke their leg, then and you just give it to them in hospital, then and then just send them home without it, then they're probably not going to get addicted, which is true. Mm -hmm. But it's it was being like the actual like study itself wasn't wrong. It was just everybody misinterpreted and then just expected that everyone else was doing their job. They've done that with amphetamines, benzodiazepines, antidepressants. They've done it with antipsychotics. They've, stra they've straight up out, uh, outright banned um, hallucinogenics. Like they, they keep doing it over and over and over again, and it's like it's not getting fixed. That's what blows my mind. So like I can't get a research thing published because I'm not paying enough to the, the, the journals but they can publish this garbage just because they have money and they don't even review the results. Well, Never right. mind post the negative results. They don't the even other, review what they do publish. The, the, other actually, the, happen, uh, um, well, the other thing that could happen with that is that what happens if you use all the right words and you talk about, you know, uh, inclusivity. Topic, inclusivity and you're like, oh, this shows that, you know, this drug will, you could, if you say the right stuff, sometimes you can get the right stuff published, and that's not science. <laughs> well, that hap that's happening in every academic field. Um, one of the other big problems with journals, and this has been going on for a very long time, is journals are trying to be cool and sell more journals. So they don't want to publish boring studies that just say, oh, this drug works. Yeah, we already knew that. Boring. How hard would it be Tell to me hire about an how this like drugs... Jordan to make one of these? To make up an an article, uh, a government medical journal, or a I don't know because journal. the thing is, is that medical you have to like you kind of need some prestige. <laughs> and no, if just you just organize like, the database and the archives and stuff, you get an archivist to set there, this thing up and then have peers review it. If there you, are people, well, that that's do what's that. happening. Like, like there's a big industry for like like LexiComp, which is a drug information resource. And people work for drug information companies. And basically all they do all day is look at studies and then summarize them and then write them into their articles. And Aren't their those things. all private companies though? They're not government run, are they? Yeah, they are private companies. Yeah, that's But what the point <laughs> is, is that you never look in one spot. Like if you are like looking for a... Um, what do I do with this patient in dialysis? You're probably not only going to look at one thing unless but you like really trust it. Would be beneficial to have a government just accept all papers and then you can look at all of them and compare all of them together, even the bad ones. The problem is maybe, but that like that's so no, much data. No, the problem is in editing because 
a lot of when you publish, you you send your manuscript in, and the editor like just destroys your paper, sends it back, and goes. I liked it. Um, work everything that I had, and you you open it up, and it's just this mess of sea of red, <laughs> like it's a sea of red markings all over it. So you got to go and do it again, and this usually happens about three or four times. If the journal is, uh, if the article is good, then it gets sent out. I don't know, probably gets sent out if they approve it, but then it gets it gets approved for peer review, and they send it out randomly to a couple people, and this is. Uh, and then it's sent back with more corrections. So then it gets refined and refined and refined. What did you mean by this word? Why are you using this paragraph? I don't like your conclusion. Like these things. Yeah, and that's then the process. Work. But the thing is, is that a lot of times what happens is you can start your own journal, hold your own conferences and like publish people. And then you can, then people can say, yeah, I'm published. And like there was the Lindsay Bogosian thing where they're writing fake uh, journal articles and sending them in and then they get published and they're like why did that get published we wrote like um how there's you know rape culture in dog parks and they made it up and there was no peer review there was no correction it just got published because they thought it was great and so they given that we know this system is not working wouldn't a better system be if you want to publish garbage fine but your name's on it first of all. So they will do their own editing and check it all and do that whole process for themselves. But there should be a place where it's accessible, where it's all there. So if yeah, you want to yeah. do another study, you can just go to one place and find everything everybody's done, good or bad. And Why the other problem... Selective that only private companies hold knowledge for like, for public like, medicine. And the like other JSON problem is that, stuff like that... No, but like you can't access most articles... Like that, that's what you I mean. want to see, yeah. like, because you have to pay to access journals, and like that's nuts. And then and you get credit for citations. Bad. So you're just trying to citation count by throwing in buzzwords and search tags and and like SEO. Yeah, on. like that. That's absolute. That's garbage. Because like, if you but actually like need to look at a paper, you can just email the author and be like, "Yo, um, I'd like to see your paper. I'm doing a project," and they'll just be like, "Yeah, man, here, have it. Do you have any but questions? Do you want to talk about it? Ta let me talk about my research." To find that. <laughs> paper though you have to go through another paywall you have to go through a search engine or some other journals got to have it a uh, high priority on google search engine or whatever you're using yeah like if it's you hard had a to search find engine stuff. that just literally yeah. looked for words in everything that was ever published it would just be a database an archive like we have the technology for it it would cost us almost nothing I think there are people working on an open source like pirate journal article database and they keep getting uh, this is like a, a rumor in my head, but I know it's happening. I just don't know the extent of it. But I also know that they're in a lot of legal trouble that they knew that they were going to be getting into. But I do respect that hustle because that's like – What's illegal about it? Copyright. Uh, copyright. That's literally it. And Oh, they're pirating they're, other people's published work? Yeah. So oh, they're, yeah, yeah. they're like – they're essentially putting this database that you're talking about together like – and like putting it online, kind of like um, the Internet Archive thing. But again, you can do but it without stealing. At the same People time, like it's kind of... just want to publish their research. Why don't you just let us publish it? I don't get why you'd stop people from doing that. Dollar the, dollar bills, y'all. <laughs> no. The no, the the other it's point is that no, we talked about this earlier. Is that like especially medical literature needs interpretation, needs a lot of interpretation, and to be able to interpret that, you need lots of training. So if we start publishing papers that everybody can access that say, this drug had two people get kidney failure out of the 40,000 people we tested in, and both of them had prior medical conditions. Both of them but like people will kidney failure. <laughs> yeah, but like the point is that people, that, that takes interpretation and risk is really, really hard to uh, see. So like there's almost a want to hide some stuff from people but see that to me is that is the opposite of what we should be doing because if you had a forum right where you can pull up any any journal article or whatever that's published in in canada because it's just one log for everything and they're allowed to publish it somewhere else as well if they want to but everything just goes to one spot right if somebody publishes a uh, bad science there can be comments put on there from other reputable journal writers and publishers to the, the government website that critiques that paper. So you can see all the critiques from all the leading scientists or armchair 
I like theorists this across the country. Yeah, and everybody well, could dispute it and discuss it, kind of rather like than annotation. having just a paper published and then you hope people interpret it right. Instead of waiting like, for the annotations the to come be, in, you could see the annotations online. Yeah, um, and you could have the the yeah, criticism like, be an engaging <laughs> thing between the public and the researchers, yeah. and it would be so much more effective and cheap. My I don't know is, why they're not doing it. My th I think I do know why they're not doing it is because. A lot, and I don't even think it's copyright and money. I think a lot of it is the intellectual establishment is still stuck in the um, journals are in the library mentality. Yeah. And we kind of need to wait for them to pass before everyone's like, why can't this just be in line? And somebody will just write it and then all of a sudden be like, there, have fun. Like, and there's no reason why you shouldn't have access to info, even if you don't get it. Like, why can't I read, like, why can't I download an in-depth paper about, like, I don't know, like, Chinese Anything. politics in 1400, which I won't get. Oh, um, I want that. But, um, but, like, why can't I just read that paper that yeah. someone did, like, five years of research for? And, you know, like, why why can't I just see that? And like, the point really is, like, that person that... Their shit read? The thing is, they still... Well, but scientists still need to get paid, and they need some mechanism to get paid. And it can't just like it needs to come from somewhere so most where they're paying to get coming published from. they're not the, getting money from a journal publication they're paying they're getting paid by a university sometimes but like but most, they could pay them to do that and publish to the government website that there's no connection between the private and public sector here but like what if you're a scientist that isn't working at a university and you want to publish papers shouldn't don't you want to be rewarded for all your work like nobody spend, has that job Nobody has self-funded research that they get money from publishing their own research. They, none of them get that. They no. get huge bankrolls from companies who want to sponsor research, or they get uh, non-profit organizations that sponsor third-party independent research. But it's always through a company. It's never individuals. Mm -hmm. But most of the individuals that I – like most scientists will be like – Money tends to be like if they think, oh, I could sell you this. No, they'll just give you their article. They'll tell, talk about it. They want to engage with people on their stuff, an actual like worth their salt scientist. I think so, yeah. And but, one of the other I've is, met these yeah, people like they'll like a lot of scholars I've met will just like they'll bring books of their own that they wrote and just hand them out because they don't care. They want people to read their shit. Like I want my work to be out there, and it's not like oh, I'm investing enough. If they read my work, then they'll do no. They wrote it so that people could read it. And like in history, that's a thing. Um, but because the act of the, the the work itself is more important than the, than the money to a lot of them. The money is just like, it'd be nice. And you do want to get paid for it. But um, it's, it's, I don't know, it, it's. One of the other issues too is that like bringing like, bringing it back to pharmaceuticals is that it still takes over a billion dollars to get a drug to market and like a billion dollars is so much money like you so, have to have a mechanism to get that sort of money to support can i bring something someone. up to guide this a bit is yes um so you get something to market mm -hmm. and then um it's helping people. You've made a good drug. You, you invested all your money. You know, it's actually a legit help thing. And then one of your middlemen, who we've discussed before, decides people want this. And they look at their, you know, first year economic supply and demand chart and be like, what if we just charged a lot of money for this? And, you know, people need it. Something like, say, insulin or EpiPens. What's happening there? Martin Scrilly's in jail. <laughs> That's the cliff notes. Good. Yeah, it's... Um, that's so, um, sorry, I, My I, issue with it is more about the distribution of information. It, okay. what, what The point of government is supposed to be to organize people in the best possible way for the best outcomes for the most people. The greater good, in other words. What greater good is there possibly to be found by privatizing journal uh, scientific papers? They've always I don't get that. Where does the intellectual property benefit absolutely anybody in society? I Everybody's know. dumber by it. I don't know why they should be public. Like, they're public, but I don't know why they shouldn't be privatized. Well, because once you make it for profit, you have to stop people from reading it so that you can get paid. Right, but 
you could just sign a law that says like they they have to be open instead of instead of you know um, absorbing them into the government because the government will be like no you're not allowed to say this you're not allowed to say this you're not allowed to say this now and that'll stunt it in different ways. You don't want the government to be in charge of the media. <laughs> we want to be smarter. It's knowledge. Why would right. money even factor into to the dissemination of scientific research? That's the one thing it shouldn't even factor into. Like right, you don't pay taxes on tuition. You don't pay taxes on uh, uh, fresh produce because it's good for your health. Like we we cut taxes on all kinds of things because we know there's a social benefit to it. But scientific research is not on that list. Right. How, explain that to me. <laughs> Not you, but I'm just saying, like, what's the logic? I can't even fathom why a person would believe that that's the right course of action to guide and lead a country in, to forbid information from being disseminated. I don't think it's much of a forbidden as much as we haven't come to terms with the new technologies yet. Before, it didn't make, like, the library, like, the libraries were trying their hardest to get hard copies, but hard copies were resources, and resources cost money. And so you do need to it, and like the, all, everyone along the chain has to eat. So you can't just like someone's got to pay for it, and whether it's the public or the industry or the people who are using the the end service. Now, right now, we have a lot of subsidies going towards that, so that the little guy, like you know us, don't have to pay like thirty thousand dollars for something, but. Um, I don't I I don't see like having the government run it. I see if the government said all journals have to be freely available, that would be a good um proclamation that they could make. Like you, you would can't have to hide journals behind paywalls. That that's a good that's a good law. It, it is, but then you still have to have some there has to be some sort of other mechanism for the journals themselves to make money because the journals are hiring all sorts of people to help with their putting together the journals get the then you're expecting them to classify themselves properly as journal publishers so that they're taxed properly and they just won't do it they'll say oh we're a magazine we're not a journal like yeah you're just going to be going through that bureaucratic circle again when all it is is saying here's a spot where you can dump information that you carefully thought out if any of it's wrong or abusive you get banned and then you need like some scholar approval maybe uh, a mechanism of like a mentorship where somebody has to oversee your research just to say that it's legitimate, not to like be involved in it, but just some kind of credibility mechanism. But like it would cost almost nothing. It would cost it's a small IT group of five people, a few servers, a few thousand dollars. It would cost absolutely nothing to run this thing. And instead, you've got these people manhandling a 10 plus million dollar a year industry of choosing what information gets to see the light of day. Yeah. Like and that to me is insane. And it's arbitrary because like one thing I would do is I still use like I'll use someone's I'll use my old U of M account to access articles or I'll use uh, like just it's like, dude, can I borrow your password? I need to get onto the website. So like I was getting around it. But at the same time, um, I don't think that accessibility, because the thing is, is accessibility is a thing, but knowing, I think the distribution, like a, a, a distribution software system that could easily be searchable would be a even more helpful, um, like an access system that would allow people to, because you can have free access to like a pile of books, but like unless they're organized and, you know, you can see all like their spines and they're all organized in the space and you can search for it using thing. It, 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 like uh, information is useless if, if it's not organized. And so when you organize it in an access system, um, then yeah, then anybody can go in there. Um, and there but will that, be, that will stop, that won't stop like, Nah, like um, people from misusing it because people can misuse data no matter what. But like that's why we have discussion. <laughs> but the thing is, you're getting into something that's not even an issue. We fixed this already. This is a problem that doesn't exist on website forums because you have a moderator or you have people report bad posts. Yeah, like I just you can object to somebody's science and then write a really cogent response to why you disagree with it and keep the both posts up. 
Right. Just because the research might be wrong doesn't mean people shouldn't be allowed to see it. And if right. somebody writes something that's abusive or flagrant, you can report it and let the community decide, throw it up for a vote. These are, aren't even issues to having something published. Right. I just because don't trust we the already have the mechanisms for, for websites and forums. Like active server pages is already a thing for indexing web pages. Right. And if everything's freely available, then people can download your entire database and run it on their computer. Like accessibility Maybe, uh, isn't an issue because we have the internet. I think a model like it's like, its own solution. The browser is that thing that you're talking about, the search right. engine and all. So I think something like, you know, a Wikipedia business model might be better, but I don't see the government as being like I've seen the government's websites. They are the most frustrating <laughs> things on the planet. I, Super um, hard. <laughs> like I don't think they have the capability of performing this in in, in the way we w would want them to. Then have the universities do it. They have comp sci. Honestly, that would probably be the best bet. It would be yeah. so easy to give somebody a PhD or a group of people PhDs to set up a system like this. Now, there are universities. A lot of the universities do come together in like large conglomerations, especially the Canadian ones. They have like um, deans agreements and stuff like that. They have like they'll come together in kind of a university cooperative and all buy licenses as a block. And then they'll all share like the same library service, which does help. Um, but um, the thing is that the money right now comes from those subscriptions from the thing. And maybe the government, the out of the the if you want the government to come into it, you can get the government to pay for the subscriptions just like they pay for the medication. Actually, that's not a bad idea. I, I I actually I do think that one of the but reasons why to... like my field might not want people to have all the same information as we do is because like say we make a clinical decision like there's like three drugs they could be on and we actually choose the more expensive one but we choose it because we think it's better for this patient because of like some other reason that's not necessarily written down then the patient goes why am I not getting this one it actually says it should be this one then you have to like do that but that's probably going to make us better at our jobs we just don't want to be annoyed with that but that's something they should be talking <laughs> to their doctors about anyway the doctor should be telling them like when they're choosing which pill to give you like my my doctor does and he's you know i'm yeah. sure he's not alone no like i, like, I would this one's new it seems to be more well tolerated the side effects are less and it doesn't like he'll explain exactly what made them come to that decision yeah, and like that's what you would want. Some people don't care though, but that's no. Like, but those people aren't going to look still... it up online and go through, scour through all these journal articles and Fair read enough. all the comments to the research paper, and like they're not going to be the ones even bringing this up. They won't even look. Most people no. won't look, but it should be there because right now the only people who need those research papers are researchers, and researchers are paying from their research budget to journals so that they can publish to journals. It's just it talk about a waste of money. <laughs> to cite another paper, you have to read it. So I have to pay for all these three different journal articles so that one of them hopefully publishes mine. That, that's yeah. an insane way of getting smarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, can, you can't like, the other thing is you can't like dismantle the, the journal funding all at once because like there are people, like there's a lot of people employed by journals and if no, you just like them. suddenly cut off their main way of getting profit, like you have to... I don't know if it's the gov it would be the government's responsibility to like Middle that's the reuse argument them. that keeps coal plants open. Yes, like, we don't want to lose jobs not burning coal, so we should just keep burning coal. Like I no, know, but it's repurpose them. <laughs> someone still has to things. make the argument because it's not like it's a bad argument. Like people, no, but all of those people can then work for the government, managing the government's website because the government's incompetent. Yeah. Like they'll all still have jobs. It's perfectly transparent. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I think the only thing that that I'm kind of stuck on is I just don't want it to be run by the government. But if it's run by universities, that might be better. I just don't want it to be run. Like well, if just, you're doing a service like this, it needs to be run by people that are, don't have like ideological yeah. backings because you don't that's, want picking that stuff to get though. in the way. Some well, you don't want stuff to get in the so way. Common. Like, okay. like you, don't, you don't want, like in science is not always as big of a deal, but some it can be a bigger deal in other fields where if you say something that people disagree with, that isn't necessarily like morally repulsive in a way that... Maybe it shouldn't be published, but it's just like a differing idea that still needs to be said. So you can't have like things just not being said because they're so, not fashionable. I think the government isn't building their own buildings. They subcontract a lot. Technical stuff is usually something they'll subcontract. To so the when I say let the government do it, I mean government funded. 
It's not okay. like to hire somebody in the government to look after it because the government's incompetent. They can't. They can't even assemble properly. <laughs> they need okay. rules just to show up to Parliament. <laughs> so, I would like to move on a bit. Um, okay. I think this horse has been beaten. Um, but <laughs> the. Um, I think it's important. That's all. So oh no! I apologize it's, for that. <laughs> I, I'm kind of. Um, I've got a few other itches that I want to scratch. Um, scratches that I want to itch. Anyway, one of them is what happens after testing uh, to get back on track. Because I do, I do, I would like to get into some of the. Because uh, like there, we, there's still some. Yeah, I didn't quite. I didn't actually quite finish that. So um, oh, keep going on that. For I'll just. I got to step out for a minute. I'll be right back. Okay. okay. Um. Yeah. So the. Um. After phase three trials, um, those are like the randomized control trials, you will be, those will be analyzed. And that takes a lot of time because they analyze like every little piece of it um, and make sure that you did, you didn't like do anything sketchy. You didn't do weird math. And if you like, you, your statistics are correct and whatever. And they'll, um, then you can get a drug approved to market, which again, that will take years after you submit it. Like it'll, it takes a long, long time. Um, the, the process can actually be shortened if like there are some countries that have deals that are like, well, if Australia did it, then, you know, you can actually skip a couple steps because you went through Australia's approval or whatever. Okay, um, but if like, if it's done by like, you know, the, people's republic of the congo you might not yeah well it's certain countries that have more similar populations because there's even sometimes if a drug study is done completely in like south africa or india and like you want to approve it in your country that is like a different patient population then you might be like you might not want to skip any steps and make sure that you do everything it's just like so who's yeah. so is this like is this where like the lobbying comes in Lobbying is involved here for sure. Um, okay. There, there are discussions and there are specific groups set up that will like talk on behalf that will help like pharmaceutical companies negotiate with Health Canada and help the Ca Health Canada understand where the pharmaceutical companies are coming from. There's a lot of like discussion in this point and so um, just back a bunch and forth. Of meetings and presentations. So and many, yes. And, and is there a procedure to this, or is it just they book us a meeting? We want to push. There's. Our there are procedures. I can't say I'm fam intimately familiar with all of the pieces of it. I just know that there's a lot of things you have to do and they'll make you correct stuff and go back and forth and they'll call in experts sometimes to help with things. And sometimes pharmaceutical companies will be like, I can't figure out why I don't get approved. So they'll like hire consultants that know more about the approval process to be like, well, actually it's because you didn't do this and whatever. So, um, yeah. So... At some point, your drug will get approved, and then you can start marketing it to be sold. So in Canada, Health Canada will approve it, but then you have to actually get it in each province and the provinces to get it in there. So that is another step that takes a while. Um, and at some point, you will start selling it eventually. Um, and then after you have marketed it and it's being sold and it's being used by just normal patients, um, then you can... then phase four trials might happen. And these are post-marketing trials. They are generally also randomized control trials. Not, and they will look for other things like, how is it working? And there might be observational. You're looking like, how, how does the drug work in a regular patient population? Another thing might happen to say, you had a couple incidences of bladder cancer or something like really odd in your Thing. So you might like do a specific study to say, is this actually because of the drug or was this just like an artifact in our um, patient population that, you know, whatever. Sometimes if you don't like bladder can or you have something, a side effect that's or some sort of like thing that's very, very rare that you would need like 50,000 patients to like know if there's a difference and you only measured it in two, th 3,000, then you won't be able to like make a conclusion about it. So sometimes you have to make bigger trials with phase four to um, find if things are actually true. So that's just the last part of drug development is that there is still studies going on after things are done. You might do like head to head studies. So 
there was two study two drugs that work on the same thing and they both compared against placebo so we don't actually know which drugs better so you might do a trial with those two drugs and see which one works better and then from there you can either that will like inform guidelines and if you do find that one drug is better than the other then that company gets money and the other company doesn't <laughs> okay so um so it's on the market at that point. Yeah, it's being sold. Patients are using it. Yeah. And is there any, uh, like, is there any, do they get, like, checked um, after that? Or is there a constant, like, you know, there is, period? there is, like, adverse drug reporting, which is kind of, it's not mandatory unless under circum certain circumstances, like if someone dies after starting a new drug, that's going that has to be reported. And that, this is only this legislation is only a couple of years old, and it's again it's local, so it depends on where exactly you are. But um, you are encouraged to report adverse effects from new drugs, but it's not, and that's to like Health Canada specifically. So Health Canada will be tracking through that, and they have other ways of looking at statistics and seeing so perhaps maybe they'll a drug will be on the market for two years after and they'll notice that like there's been a lot of like whatever disease heart attacks or something on this drug so and they'll like say like you need to do you need to do a study to like see if this is an actual thing or maybe there's just other factors but we've got some sort of signal that's saying um and like you can catch drugs that way that cause does it get taken off the market while it's under study not usually i don't believe so like um and the thing is if, if you have a drug that like that there's a drug for um what's it called uh i don't remember what it's called okay whatever i won't i won't use that example then well the but COVID if you have an a easy example with the blood clots because they were rushing through the trials as soon as they came up with a couple blood clot cases they banned it and then had to review everything just uh quickly yeah they, they banned it in certain groups so like the, or what might happen is say that they're like finding that there's weird cases of like heart failure so they might recommend that it's not used in patients with either like all the risk factors for heart failure or something so they'll restrict the usage to not include that group or maybe they're finding that there's like liver issues with the drug so they'll like the guidelines will recommend you do liver enzymes every six months or every three months or something to check and see if it's working and maybe don't use in your patients that already have elevated levels or something so they'll they might do something like that and the, another thing that can happen is say you do find that yeah this drug actually does cause liver damage what can happen is it can just be straight up removed from the market or you could get what's called a black box warning. So there's just a big warning on the box that it's like warning, do not use in patients with liver failure or hepatitis or is whatever like other cigarettes? conditions. And well, the reason they do that is because like the drug has some sort of use or purpose that makes it worth it. So like even if so, you've got like um, allopurinol, which is used in gout fairly often. It has a warning about um, skin conditions because it can cause like very severe allergic reactions that can result in death. So there's like monitoring and stuff that you need to do and you need to look for certain things and start at a really low dose and slowly move up. And there's like things you need to do. But it was determined that it is so important to helping people with gout not get flares and reducing the amount of flares um, depending. And there's a few factors that determine when you start it. So if you get one gout flare, you're probably not going to start it. Usually you need more than one, but that's another story. Point is, is that you have certain rules to follow in order to use that drug. And there's a bunch of drugs on the market like that, that you can't use in a certain patient group, or you can't use unless you do this monitoring or whatever. So those are drugs that would be considered still important enough to keep on the market for, because they have some sort of use that we don't have anything else for. So it's determined worth it to keep it on. So that can happen as well. This like, is, this yeah. is not the same type of label that you see on a cigarette. No, no, those are like legal. Like, this is bad, and they're usually really gross pictures. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, why would so then in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, a drug is right once it's regulated and out on the market? Mm -hmm. Um, who sets the price for it? 
How do the they... provinces. Provinces. So the provinces negotiate with the. Uh, also. With. The... There's like boards on the province who will negotiate a price, and that price has that's what the drug is sold at for the entire province. So, really, drug prices are pretty much the same wherever you buy it from. Costco charges less dispensing fees um, because they uh, make so much money everywhere else that they don't really need their pharmacy to make money. So. Right, so that there's because the, the the pharmaceutical company is going to say you should charge a bit more, and then end up paying me more. Uh, but then the province is probably going to be like, mm, well, how much is the consumer going to pay with insurance? How much is the consumer without insurance going to pay? How much is um, mm-hmm. like how much is it actually like how what's the cost of it? And they're going to make that general yes. So there's decision. that, and then insurance companies will then jump in there and be like, how much are we going to pay? So insurance companies that usually they have like we'll cover eighty percent of everything, but it's usually not everything, and there's usually little rules and stuff. So that all right. that will sort of happen as the, before the drug is sold. Very recently, I had I'm paying double now because. There was a price renegotiation with the insurance company, and yep. now I'm paying double. But it's still a, generally a reasonable amount. Um, I I'm not really complaining, but um, yeah, I think they're still covering fifty percent or so. So yeah, but at the mm-hmm. same time, like that's not exactly a very revolutionary. That's not like a yeah that's not a obscure drug, mm-hmm. uh, which we're not going to get into. But um, the 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 problem happens like what's happening when all of a sudden something that isn't obscure say like insulin or uh, mm-hmm. something becomes because I don't know if this is even possible in Canada but uh, in the states it's definitely been some screwy things happening what's going on with that There's, it seems to be um, the yeah price. people are pay- needing to pay thousands of dollars for insulin and like insulin is not something that you can live without if you're a type 1 diabetic like you you'll die if you don't get it and it's absolutely terrifying and completely horrifying that it's happening that these prices are going to a point where people there's no way you can afford it on any sort of regular job unless you're like making six figures and whatever like even then it's a, it's a burden like it's not it's not okay and from what little bit i've heard it's again a problem of middlemen and insurance companies negotiating stuff and it's not necessarily just the pharmaceutical companies being like Mwahaha, how can i make more money today it's there's a lot going on and it's not just like one person's fault but there is it's wrong and there's it's kind of horrifying. Like in Canada, insulin is still, it's not cheap, but it's no, it's, it's still more affordable than it is in the States. And one of the things that's happening as a result of that is that people are now only using the cheapest type of insulin or your like regular insulin or your NPH insulin. So um, regular insulin is just like, it looks the same as normal human insulin behaves the same way, but it isn't it. And NPH just has a, um, it it's a, like a twice a day basal. So when you're using insulin, you need a, a you need some in your system at all times. And then when you eat a meal, you need a spike. So that's why you need, you have your like long acting and short acting insulin. But the like regular insulin and the cheap NPH insulin, which is regular insulin with a salt in it that I can't remember what it is, um, that prevents it from being released quickly. They're cheaper, but they also can lead to more lows and more side effects and more issues. The um, newer gen- or engineered ones tend to be a little bit better, but they're more expensive. So uh, and like way more expensive in the states. In Canada, it's like not as crazily more expensive, but it's still more expensive. But we're definitely you're seeing more people using the old type of insulin and using like a syringe and a needle instead of like the nice pens that they come in that are much easier to use. So um, it's kind of an odd process well the, the one thing i'd like to add in there is just in the states they, they don't even have the excuse that they had research and development because they were basically gifted the insulin formula from canada <laughs> yeah from a canadian <laughs> yes. who gave it to a university and then a university sold um so toronto uh, you the university of toronto sold the patent for insulin for one dollar 
because yeah because everybody the idea have was to that like these people will die without it and like a lot of times like type 1 diabetes usually shows up in like childhood to early adulthood so like these are kids you've got like an eight-year-old kid now that will die without this and you're just gonna charge them twelve hundred dollars a month like are you insane this that like that's horrifying yeah and the other part to it is um like bayer is one of the the main makers of diabetic equipment and they just recently merged or bought out monsanto who is like the biggest corn maker in the states and we won't get into gmos and like intellectual property with genes or anything but considering the united states is subsidizing corn crops and corn crops are paying out 90 percent to monsanto and monsanto is using all that corn sugar to put sugar in food so they're selling corn sugar super cheap and causing diabetes for bayer to overcharge for their equipment and for insulin manufacturers to even have a say in what the price is to me that again just screams crap. that is that is sketchy that is um, so sketchy. The other, the, the other point I will make is that insulin is used in type 2 diabetics, but it's not the same thing where they will die without it. Like, it, they'll lose control of their... Like, there, there are other medications they can use that can work to a point. Like, it's, it's complicated managing type 2 diabetes, but the point is, is that it's not quite the same. So the diabetes that you would get from, like, eating all these now cheap, sugar products um wouldn't necessarily be as bad but yeah that's definitely sketchy like selling and the just, poison and the cure that's sketchy. yeah <laughs> and just one other comment though for canadians anybody in the country who can't afford insulin will still get it they do not yeah. stop you from getting insulin all you have to do mm -hmm. is go to the pharmacist and the pharmacist will just give you a sample pack and you could just yeah. keep doing it if you have to but you'll like never yeah they it. i really that's, like that there's there's a few things like um in at least where I am, like medications for HIV fully subsidized. Same mm -hmm. with hepatitis C, which can also be transferred through, um, through sex or through bloodborne, um, or through like injections, sharing its supplies and stuff. So um, the those are fully subsidized and um, like prep, which is to prevent HIV in people that are engaging in behaviors that might increase the risk. That's also covered. So. There are things that are being covered, and I think that that's good and that we should keep working towards that, especially those sorts of infectious diseases that spread and cause issues. Um, especially when you need to inject insulin. Like, you're only encouraging people to share needles, too. Not that they yeah. do, but I'm just saying, like... Yeah. Um, just for everyone out there, if you are using insulin or any other injectable, please don't reuse your needles because they get dull and they hurt. That and they can they can have what do you call it? Bacteria grows on it. Yeah, yeah. they go stale or whatever. I yeah, don't so don't don't reuse them. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, like that's that's sketchy. Same with the there was an epipen. The epipens went up four hundred percent or something. Like oh, just it was an more insane than, it was like four thousand percent. Yeah, that was which Martin is Shkreli not thing good. that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's that's really sketchy and not good. Um, the I mean, so EpiPens in Canada bought yeah. the intellectual property and wanted to make money off it. There was no other reason for them buying it other than the fact that they knew that they could turn yeah. up the price and just make a huge windfall out of nowhere for nothing off the backs of sick people. Yeah, and that screwed up. And I'm glad that that got dealt with. Um, yeah, EpiPens in Canada are hovering around 120 dollars ish. Um, so. It's still expensive because um, they do expire eventually. So even if you don't use them, usually you have to rebuy at least every year. Really hard to say. It depends Two on years, what the. I think. Yeah, it, it depends on when the, like when you like you get it from your your you you like buy EpiPen. So your pharmacy and you'll be like, oh, we've only got two left. Let's buy ten more. So we've got enough in stock. And then they'll come and the ten more you bought will actually expire before those two. And you're like, what? Even though you bought those two two years ago, you're like, what That's is happening? <laughs> like, it's just, it's something that we just have to deal with. And like, usually if you get something from a company that expires within six months, if it's usually, if you usually can get a year or two out of it, sometimes you can get money back. But yeah, like it just sometimes depends on availability and sometimes like EpiPen shortages are real. So sometimes it's better to get one that expires sooner rather than not have one at all. And 
if you use an EpiPen that's expired by like two weeks, it's probably still going to be more effective than not using an EpiPen at all. So it seems like bad business to me because studying history, a lot of the people that made the most money in the last 200 years were the ones who are like, how can I sell this to everybody instead of just the rich people? And those were the ones that made all the money. And it seems like you have all these opportunities, especially in this field, to be like, how can I make this in such a way that I can get it to the pe- to as many people that need it as possible and then make yeah. millions of dollars off of it, selling it for yeah. cheaper. Of course, because it's quality. Yeah, it's like, still healthcare. So, I mean, you can't give everyone everything because no, then they, that would be bad. But, so, the more obscure something is, it's going to be inherently more um, more expensive. But and the that's, more obscure it is, then yeah. we should just cover it because it's probably not going to come up that much and, and help that person. Yeah, that's kind of a point I wanted to bring up earlier is that, um, and I was talking about this when I was first describing d- drug development at the beginning of this episode, where certain things get studied more because they're easier to study. Cardiology is probably the best studied medicine. There's like very specific rules for like, you have a heart attack, you get these five drugs, you you get them for this many days, then we do a checkup after this amount of time. And like, it's very regimented. It's pretty like there's some wiggle room, but there's quite a bit of studies. And why is that? Well, it's easy to gather a bunch of people that are probably that are at high risk of heart attack and give them either the drug either give them the drug or don't give them the drug or compare to compare your drug with an old drug or whatever you're doing and a lot of people are going to either be hospitalized for a heart attack or whatever so you'll get like numbers of people and like it's a very definite you either had a heart attack or you didn't have a heart attack it makes the statistics easy and so many people have cardiovascular disease in the world like like the people that started making statins like they made so much money because so many people could have benefit. Is it actually worth it all the time? No, but we talked about that a little earlier, that the benefit might be good, but if your risk is so low already, then it doesn't matter. But there's still a lot of people that can benefit from drugs for cardiology because a lot of people have issues with their heart just based on like diet, exercise, cultural practices of the day. So the if you want to make money in your drug company, you try to make drugs in heart failure and heart and like to prevent heart attacks like that is where because they're common they're easy to study there's already a lot of studies on it so it's that makes it also you don't have to like invent new processes to study it's already there um so we end up having better evidence in those areas and we end up studying those areas even more which isn't good for you know when you have somebody with like OCD that is having a hard time leaving their house because they are just stuck in routines. What do we do about that? Like, how do you even study that? It's very difficult to do a randomized control trial on people with conditions such as that. Like, so they don't get done and then we don't study those areas as much and then people ignore them and then they don't get better, right? So there's, that is an issue that people are aware of, but and there are studies being done in mental health, but a lot of them are, it's, they're hard to run. They're hard to do. They sometimes don't tell you anything. Well, most so, of the campaigns to get that done are just awareness campaigns that. Yeah, know, I can talk. It's like, oh, great. Now I'm aware of this thing. I can talk again about <laughs> like, you know, go for a bath. Go see, go visit your friend. Um, go for a jog. Do some yoga. And it's Cheer like, <laughs> that's cool like great excellent like go for a walk outside and you're like yeah i live in like the ugliest neighborhood ever so whatever um, you guys but, sell but, ammo <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah, also right? like the, the underlying and, complications too is that people with mental illnesses their other treatable illnesses sometimes don't get looked at because the person themselves isn't advocating or seeking help or like following up on their medication it is or whatever if you have diabetes your risk of having depression is like triple like it's way higher yeah. any chron if you have any chronic disease at all your risk of depression and anxiety just like jumps immediately because and if you help control the chronic disease will that always help the mental health sometimes but it's and like there's a lot of things that contribute to mental health like we don't we I don't even know if we understand everything, but like for sure, 
being alone and not being able to see my friends during this pandemic, that is not helping anything. And I know I'm not the only one. So no, and they don't even know what's causal yet either. Because sometimes you could have a, like um, a chronic illness cause a mental health problem. And sometimes yeah, you can have a legit psychosomatic symptoms from a mental health issue and have that's, physical um, disruptions in your body. With, uh, multiple sclerosis, MS, you can have depression that's like related to your MS. It's basically a side effect is MS. It's not yeah, even exactly. considered like, oh, your disease is having a huge impact on your life and that's affecting your ability to function in life. And that's what's caught. No, it's just like it MS is, is giving MS. you depression. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that's so that's one scenario where specifically we're like, yeah, that's why. And like you've th there's been people that have like sustained like severe concussions or traumatic brain injuries that end up being super depressed. And like you can say that that's from that. But more often it's just is but things are like your mind and body are not the same thing i mean they are the same thing they're not two separate things and so i mean if you've got if you're in chronic pain like say you hurt your ankle at work and you're not able to get time off work because you're busy and you don't really take care of the pain like whatever for whatever reason it turns into like chronic neuropathic pain that's probably going to also contribute to depression like chronic pain and depression are very very closely linked so mm -hmm. um and so is things like anxiety and um like body function and regulation like sleep uh diet appetite overeating yeah. like eating disorders are notoriously anxiety disorders and like that. um irritable bowel syndrome is like almost always comorbid with anxiety and depression yeah like very often things like um uh, fibromyalgia too and diabetic um, neuropathy affects the way your digestive system works so you it can does just getting exercise walking or uh you can have respiratory mm -hmm. what do you call that uh, when you're not breathing Diseases. deep enough or whatever yeah. yeah like just all those natural reflexes that people take for granted that their vagus nerve just handles for them like blink. yeah I mean, when you have a mental disorder, then your brain's not doing things like blinking or digesting properly, too, in some instances. Just yeah, and like it's it's pretty common problem. for for people with like anxiety to have like issues with with like that they'll get like cases of diarrhea and stuff. Like that's not uncommon. Well, your and body's at a heightened. State everything's related, for too right? Too long, then like your body's yeah. your body's supposed to be able to have anxiety something's wrong something's mm -hmm. not right something's not yeah. jiving or you're supposed to have stress yeah. be able to deal with stress but if you're at if your body's doing this for long enough then it's just it's it it's like it has physical it ends up causing like permanent damage as well yeah. like that's one of the reasons why the it, like the risk of like heart attacks and stuff has gone up so high is because people are under stress all the time and like you're supposed to have times of stress but you're also supposed to have, supposed to have like your your because you have your like your you know your fight or flight but you're also supposed to have your rest or digest system activating and you want it you need oh both yeah i think it's cute uh, but i hadn't heard that before school but yeah your rest or digest is the opposite you, you have two different systems and they're both always working fight or flight and rest and digest and they're both always on and both always on but like you can have one on more than the other and that affects things like sweating heart rate breathing rate Metabol digestion general metabolism yeah. like mood as well anxiety that sort of thing so they're all it's all related um and like there's drugs that target one system or the other that block one system or stop the other system so that's why we have to know about it so much. But, and that's yeah. what you mean by stimulants and depressants is that type of mechanism of action, right? Not Category? necessarily. Um, oh. It's stimulants and depressants is more of a um, example of cause. Like, what is it doing? Like, or stimulants like make nerves fire, and depressants make nerves fire less. It's kind oh. of that simple. So, like, technically. Um, amphetamines used for ADHD are stimulants, but when you give it to somebody with ADHD, they sometimes they just get calmer and more able to focus and do whatever they were doing, right? So, and like technically, alcohol alcohol is a depressant, but like if you give a girl three drinks, she might be dancing on a table, right? So, um, <laughs> a girl is that uh, experience or just? Oh no, no, not of course not. <laughs> Hypothetical. I've never done anything crazy. No. <laughs> You are in the army. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so we should edit that out. <laughs>
So I think I might have to uh, to close out in a bit. I gotta get to my my food and exercise myself and take my yeah. medications as prescribed. Um, did you guys have any final comments before before we head out, or anything you wanted to cover before we left it off? I think, well, for me, the far pharmacist well is when all this like drugs do serve a purpose, but I think. The biggest thing is almost cliche now is that like you take what you need, not take what you think you need. And the pharmacist helps you with that. And yeah, be critical of it, I guess, is what I'm saying. Like, don't just mm -hmm. take it because you think you need it. Take it because like it's a tool that is going to affect your body in a certain way. Mm -hmm. and, and you want to ask questions and know what else you can do. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't really have anything other than that. Diet and exercise yeah. fixes everything. Do that first. Not not everything, everything, but, but yeah. many, many, many things. If you <laughs> keep your diet good and you exercise every day, your risk of many things goes down. That doesn't mean you won't get it. It just means... Will it help my legs grow back? But it, no. will, it does um, mean if you do get it, it'll help treat it. That yeah. too. And you can, you, you can sometimes recover faster. But yeah. It's crazy how much living a healthy lifestyle yeah it's after a workout you just <laughs> you, sometimes longer you have to be less tired first but you, the point gets, is <laughs> there's there's greater greater returns um yeah drink water <laughs> yeah just do all the little things you that we all know we need to do to stay healthy and try to do those and um if you get sick then be critical talk to your doctors talk to your pharmacists talk to people and do the best you can to make yourself living to make yourself live the best life you can. That's cool. all I got. Well, our soon-to-be apothecaris has spoken. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate having you on the show as always. Yes, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. 